I want to talk about bees now. Honeybees. Um, this is this is a little bit I'm going to read is uh, written by Tom Hennigan, and he's a science teacher uh, from uh, New York State. Uh, he was a an atheist for a lot of years, and he loved science. He loved biology, and he was studying biology, and he he was kind of confronted with some of the the, the, the conundrums and the, the the weird things that you find in biology. In fact, particularly on his study of the honeybee, he changed his mind <laughs> and, and came to believe that God must exist. And subsequently, he became a Christian. So he he in his article, it, which is online, and I can can help you find it if you, if you're interested because it's really quite interesting. Uh, there's a lot of things about the bee which are amazing. I mean, just the bee, one single solitary bee by itself is an astonishing creature. It can fly like better than a helicopter, right, and hover around things and close in and take off and go fast and, you know, multi-directional. It can s sit on the ceiling and not fall off, right, <laughs> as all f insects pretty much can. It's got all those kinds, of, it's got compound eyes. Um, but what he was really intrigued by, or one of the things he was intrigued by, was the, the honeycomb, was the, the society of bees, the hive. And so he talks about the honeycomb, which I never really heard about before. Honeycomb is the foundation upon which the bee colony is built. It is used to receive eggs, to grow brood, the little ones, and store honey. The very young bees make the wax for the honeycomb. For 18 to 24 hours, they cling together until the hive temperature reaches about 27 degrees centigrade, which, for your reference, is about what it is here right now. <laughs> what is it? 27. What is it? It's exactly what it is up here right now. <laughs> so this is what it's supposed to be like in the hive. When tiny wax flakes appear on their abdomens from eight small pocket-like glands. They got these little pockets and wax comes out. These youngsters scrape off the wax with their forelegs, chew it into a soft pliable ball and place it at the base of a sheet of foundation. Another bee takes over and begins drawing it out. A third will finish the process. The wonder of it all is that this work is happening throughout the hive in total darkness while the bees are upside down and clinging to a partner above. <laughs> so that's just the beginning of how, how the, the wax is produced. Both sides of the, of the foundation are being done by crews working independently. Yet the base of each cell is centered at the point where the three sides of the cells on the opposite walls meet. This has led researchers to believe that there is some kind of complex communication taking place. Really. This building design is critical in obtaining the greatest strength. The finished wax product is in the shape of a hexagon, which is six sides, right? This truly is the optimal design for it holds the maximum amount of honey with a minimal amount of wax. Though the cell walls are a mere 50 to 70 thousandths of a millimeter thick, its strength is such that one kilogram of beeswax, which contains about 105,000 cells, is capable of holding 22 kilograms of honey. That's strong. So, so that's just his story about, uh, about, the, about the beeswax. <laughs> and then he goes on, he talks about the, the foragers. One of the things I remember about bees, I, I, I took a course in, about commu of communication course in university. I remember hearing about the, the, did you know that bees, if a bee finds a patch of flowers and wants to send the other bees, it comes back to the hive and does a dance. And it describes in its dance how they can go and uh, go to find the flowers without that bee going. Okay, yeah, communication. Crazy. So, so then they go and they gather nectar, but the, pro the problem with nectar is it's mostly water. So in order for, to, bru to produce honey in the, you know, in the honeycomb, uh, they have to get rid of a lot of that water. So here's something that they do, and this may remind you of something you've been doing the last few weeks. The bees help this process along by performing an extraordinary feat. At night, after a long day of gathering nectar, they gather at the hive entrance and begin fanning by vigorously beating their wings. Half the colony may be on one side whisking air in, and the other half congregating on the other, blowing air laden with water vapor out. The breeze created increases the rate of evaporation of water from the nectar and can be strong enough to blow out a lit match when placed at the entrance. Pretty cool. So it's like, you know, when it's hot outside, you, you're kind of blowing, bl blowing the fan. When, you, when it gets cold at night, you put your fan in the window and you blow the cool air in. It's the same idea. <laughs> Except they're doing it with their itty bitty wings. A whole lots of them. Now, now I didn't, I didn't, I'm not going to read this one, but he was even more amazed by this little thing. That when the temperature of the hive gets out of hand, it starts to get too hot. 
they, uh, they send the signal out to all the bees, <laughs> and uh, a bunch of the bees go and get water, and bring water, in, uh, extra water, into the hive from like a water source, wherever that might be. They bring water into the hive and kind of sprinkle the water around, and then they start fanning. So they have extra water that they evaporate off, and as it evaporates off, it, it has a cooling effect. It's the latent heat of evaporation. My friends, that's how they make air conditioners. <laughs> so thousands of years before we ever thought of it, bees had air conditioning in their hives. Pretty, that's pretty awesome, I think. So <laughs> uh, all of this, you, you think about this, it's, it's astounding, really. How did this happen? How did it come to be? How did all this, and it all has to work together again. It's this irreducible complexity. It's huge evidence for a, desi a design and for a designer, therefore, a creator. Uh, just something for you to you just watch a few insects floating around, maybe the odd honeybee, you can keep that in the back of your mind. So uh, we, we've talked about uh, the credibility of scripture um, having a lot to do with, with uh, its teaching on creation. Also, our, uh, it enhances our worship and our idea and our concept of the sovereignty and the power of God when we believe in creation. But perhaps an even more important connection to creation is to Jesus himself. The heart of our belief is that God, the God who made us, has at, some at this point in history become one of us. And then he has died for us and in our place. And then he, he rose from the grave and he, he, he conquered death for us. And in fact, uh, if you read the New Testament carefully, it, in many places it, it, it uh, teaches that what Jesus did was actually put an end to the old that he might bring in the new. So he, in, his, in his death, the old creation which was broken died, in a sense. And in his resurrection, he brought into being a whole new creation. He's the beginning of that new creation, of which we're a part. And uh, we're, we're, we're sensing it and experiencing it and, and seeing it day by day a little bit more in our own hearts and lives. So uh, if there is no creator to whom we answer, we don't need forgiveness. We don't need restoration. We don't need transformation. We don't need eternal life. We don't need Jesus in that sense. We just probably need to pull up our bootstraps and work harder and be better and evolve more. Right? So, so really, the, the heart, the core of what we believe as Christians and as followers of Christ is actually built on the foundation of the creation account. That God made a beautiful world uh, that, that, that is fallen and in need of, uh, need of his help to, to bring it back, to restore it. And that's what Christ came to do. So, you know, outside of that, we don't really need Jesus, except perhaps as an example of good living, which interestingly is how he is viewed today by most, and including a large number of leaders in the church. But he is so much more, Jesus. So the good news is this. I mean, there's lots of good news. But the universe is basically chock full of evidence of a wise, powerful, imaginative, and loving God. He has not left himself without abundant witness. He has. The Bible makes sense about this and about everything else. We, we must answer to this God. But we can be totally forgiven, totally accepted, totally healed, totally changed, and we can live forever through faith in Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its testimony to your power in, in making this universe.